So now we are at Vajra Statement 12 for Chapter 4. And Chapter 4 is the training of the Bodhisattvas chapter. Remember that Chapter 3, 4 and 5 are basically what is often known as the Three Vows. Uh, not like literally three vows, one, two, three, but the three sets of vows, the three levels of training, um, this individual liberation, uh, which is chapter three, uh, then the Bodhisattva uh, commitment, which is this chapter, and then the Tantric uh, Samayas, the commitments of the tantric training, uh, which uh, is um, called uh, the observance of the mantra awareness holders, uh, vidyadara awareness holders, uh, and that is uh, chapter five. Chapter four is a pretty long chapter. Uh, there is um, altogether 24 statements. Uh, so we are halfway through chapter four. You'll see that in chapter four, as I said, um, it is not just talking about um, what we would recognize as more specifically the different vows and trainings for a bodhisattva. Uh, <clears throat> chapter three, four, and five uh, are about the three levels of training. It's about the three uh, sets of vows. Uh, but they are not intended as um, for you to learn the specifics of the vows. Uh, the specific of those vows um, you are already to know from other contexts, from other places. Uh, so if you are a monk or a nun, then you should know, you know, all the prescriptions and the proscriptions related to, to that, uh, that set of vows. Uh, then as a lay person, at least you should know the five uh, lay vows. Um, then um, with the Bodhisattva uh, trainings, uh, what are the different vows, the different commitments, uh, you should learn that um, again from other places and not, not from here. Uh, this is not the place where uh, it goes into discussing the specific do's and don'ts. Remember that these are uh, kind of, um, you can say, evocative, uh, if not sometimes provocative uh, statements that Kyopar Rinpoche made in relation uh, to these three topics and then organized into these three chapters here. Uh, so for uh, 12, it says, people claim that the three veils and the three obscurations uh, differ from one another. So again, um, in the uh, development of uh, the Buddhist tradition, from the time of Buddha Shakyamuni uh, down to Gyobha Rinpoche's time, uh, an, an, uh, a long time has passed. And Gyobha Rinpoche lived in the 12th century, uh, but the Shakyamuni probably around 5th century BC. So you have about at least 15, 1600 years. So there's been a lot of uh, growth and development and necessarily then um, you could say that in the Buddha's own time, all his teachings were uh, extemporaneous, uh, given directly, immediately, you know, without it being organized and all of that, but given very directly to um, people who came to him and sought instructions, people who wanted to be freed uh, from the pain that they were feeling. And then people who committed to training with him and traveled with him and lived with him. And so, you know, sometimes it's uh, uh, a specific situation that prompted certain teachings that he gave. At other times, uh, it was in the context of, um, you know, uh, his regular teaching of his students. So all these different teachings um, 
occurred. Then later, over time, right, immediately after his passing, we hear that uh, his senior most disciples, who were all considered arhats, who have achieved arhats at that point, they gathered for three months immediately after uh, all the ceremonies were performed for the cremation of the Buddha. Um, they gathered for three months where they all decided um, which are the teachings that they have all heard from the Buddha. And they recited them, repeated them, memorized them. Uh, in some ways, uh, that is the beginning of the process of codification, beginning of the process of a tradition building. Yeah. I think we have to distinguish, you know, uh, between Buddha teaching, simply teaching, yeah, to guide students along the path, to guide students away from suffering. And then the next level of work, uh, which is the level of um, tradition building, articulating an identity for this body of teachings, this particular approach to spirituality. So that began, yeah, and that began, and then it, it, it got more and more uh, complex. It got more and more uh, complicated. And then as, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> when things were finally written down, uh, that surely brought another level of uh, reflection and scrutiny of all the words of the Buddha. It's one thing to kind of remember uh, here and there, even if people back then have much better memory and they had a very strong oral culture that was designed to memorize huge chunks of information in very accurate ways, uh, not just like the general ideas, you know, but uh, India had a very sophisticated oral culture of memorizing texts. Yeah, the most sacred texts of India uh, for Hindus are called the Veda. And the Veda uh, has like four big sections, four big books. Uh, but the Veda was never written down. Uh, if you try to understand you know, and appreciate that the Veda wasn't written down until the British came to India right? because Hindus considered the Veda to be so sacred and the ultimately sacred things, especially for Hindus, right? is not to be written down <laughs> because when you write it down, you can corrupt it. Very different from the way we think. We think, oh, if you don't write it down, you will corrupt it by forgetfulness. Oh, but no, you know, this culture allocated all its resources to the the accurate memorization of oral texts such as the Veda. So when Buddhists started to write things down, uh, that was very kind of um, unusual in this religious context of India. Most traditions of India did not really, in this early part, <clears throat> did not see writing as something that is um, befitting um, to something so sacred. But Buddhists started to write things down. So when Buddhists started to write things down, then um, you bring a whole other layer of analysis of material that is different from like oral texts. As, as, as sophisticated as the oral culture was, writing and the writing culture brings about, you know, a different outlook. I don't think, you know, like traditionally, when we talk about this, <clears throat> much attention has been given to how, you know, when, when the tradition went from uh, exclusively oral to a mix of oral and written, some major uh, consequences must have arose. Mm. Now, of course, in the Buddhist tradition, they continue to emphasize the importance to also have the oral aspect. And so we talk so much about oral transmission, the reading transmission of texts, although these days done in a more kind of ritual way, you know, 
But then even that until recently in the Tibetan monastic education, uh, people memorize uh, a lot of texts, chunks of texts, if not entire texts. Mm. So um, we know that by 200 years, 300 years after the passing of Buddha, then the Buddhist tradition became both uh, oral and written, a combination of the two. As then, of course, with the uh, written down, then people could study and compare material in a way that they couldn't so easily in the past. Uh, but again, you know, try, try to also remember, you know, even back then, even though it was written down, it's not like you can just print a thousand copies, you know, and distribute, you know, even written texts uh, were very rare even if they were written down. Not, not that everyone had access to written texts. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Oh, so I see that May is here. Uh, I, maybe you don't know, but we start earlier. Uh, we, we start at 8 uh, every morning. Sorry, I didn't know. I've been out of class for too long. Yes. But so. I'll make a note and join <laughs> next, next yeah. time. Uh, you should be... Most of our announcements are na made on the WhatsApp group, and so, uh, so anyway. Mm. I'll pay. I'll, I'll pay close attention next yeah. time. Hello, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um. So here, you know, mm, mm, the notion of veils huh, or obscuration. A veil is that which cover, right? That which covers. So obscuration. Mm. So here it talks about the three veils, <clears throat> the three <clears throat> obscurations. Eh? Uh, and so he, the, the counterposition is people say uh, that the three veils uh, differ from one another. And so again and you, again, you see how Kyoba Rinpoche's statements are often mm, one thing to kind of challenge us to look at things on a deeper level. In some way, you could say that as the tradition grew over time, right? Mm, the, as the tradition grew over time, the, the tendency to separate out, you know, details, you know, five of this, yeah, five of the five, uh, each can be divided into three. <clears throat> that tendency, you know, grew stronger and stronger and stronger. And so then the emphasis on uh, differences between these categories and subcategories went stronger and stronger. And you can almost say that Almost always, Kyoba Rinpoche wants to kind of reverse course, you know, or at least balance things up by saying, but on a deeper level, they're not, they, 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 they're not that different. Now, to be fair, I think those who emphasize the differentiating out, you know, like what we might call splitting hairs, you know, uh, in the English expression as, as an insult, you say to someone, you know, you're just splitting hair. Uh, that means you're saying like, you know, you're, you're just like, you know, uh, picking on all oh, those minute differences of things and, you know, and making an argument out of these minute differences. Mm -hmm. To be fair to those who emphasize that, they will say, no, that's one way of sharpening. Uh, your, your thoughts. That's one way of sharpening and gaining clarity. Right? Because after all, Buddha taught, you know, it's the lack of clarity that causes suffering. On this other side that says, you know, but if you go too far in that, you end up having not what the Buddha is really talking about when he says wisdom, but you get caught up 
in a thicket of views, which again, in the early sources, the Buddha also warned against getting caught up in this and that view, this and that opinion, this and that philosophy, this and that. Yeah. So both of these uh, are there, you know. On the one hand, you see in the Buddhist tradition, tremendous emphasis on uh, analysis, investigation, clear seeing. On the other hand, but they're also warned against getting caught up, getting entangled, like a thicket of thorns, you know, thicket in that, like getting stuck, you know, trapped in this churning out of thoughts. And so, Gyoba Rinpoche's style is more to emphasize, yeah, more than or more often than not, yeah, is reminding people don't get caught up in mm, divisions. Yeah, and so here, you know, for sure, you know, uh, in the Abhidharma, in the philosophy, philosophical writings, yeah, they will uh, very easily you'll find this that they will say. There are three obscurations, there are three veils. And then in discussing them, they, they will emphasize how they are different. Right? But here, Gyobar Rinpoche's statement is, the three veils are the veil of the afflictions, the klesha veil. So in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, division into three veils, uh, the affliction veil is one of them. So in other words, what Kyobar Rinpoche is saying is like, in the end, when we talk about these three veils, uh, they can be understood as basically the veil of afflictions, the obscuration of afflictions. And so anyway, uh, then Chodra quotes the Uttara Tantra, Uttara Tantra, despite the name Tantra, is not a tantric text. Right? You, you should know. It's it's a sutra, it's a uh, you can say sutra level text, uh, but it's not a sutra. Uh, it was a treatise. Uh, it was a, a, a extended kind of essay, uh, a treatise attributed to Maitreya, the future Buddha. Maitreya is said to be the author of five key uh, philosophical texts, uh, shastras, treaties, of which the Uttara Tantra is one of them. Uttara Tantra has another name called the Ratnagotra. Uh, Ratnagotra Vibhaga uh, is the uh, other name of Uttara Tantra. In Tibetan sources, they tend to call it Uttara Tantra. Which is can be translated as the unsurpassed continuum, and this continuum is referring to Buddha nature. The continuum, the unsurpassed continuum. So Uttara Tantra is basically the main source text for Buddha nature teachings in Indian and Tibetan Buddhism. Uttara Tantra is the main source text for the teaching on uh, Buddha nature. So Kyoba Rinpoche uh, and the Dugong people and Kagyu people in general quotes extensively from Uttara Tantra. Especially Mahamudra, uh, it is said that uh, Gampopa's way of teaching Mahamudra uh, is fundamentally derived from uh, the Uttara Tantra. So you'll see a lot of uh, quotations from the Uttara Tantra. And so here Chodra says, the Uttara Tantra says, any conception of the three spheres is held to be a veil of the objects of knowledge. Any conception such as stinginess is held to be the veil of the afflictions. So now two veils uh, are referred to in this uh, quote. 
the veil of the objects of knowledge. So that's one. The veil of uh, afflictions. The root of the twofold division into root and branches of the afflictions taught here is cognitive misorientation and delusion. So Choda uh, explains and says, so if you want to divide the veils into two veils, then you have the root veil and the branch veil. Sorry, here he's talking about afflictions first. Let's not jump ahead. Uh, so he says, you know, and then when it comes to afflictions, like klesha, uh, sometimes he says, you know, in, in discussing kleshas, afflictions, uh, there is the division into root and branch. And as for the root and the branch, uh, they are related to cognitive misorientation, uh, what's normally translated as ignorance and delusion, which is the more subtle of the two. And the cognitive misorientation, this is Sobish's um, preference for uh, what in other Buddhist texts, other Buddhist English books, you'll, you'll see ignorance. And, and specifically, what is the ignorance? So then Sobish's uh, mm, mm, choice for that as cognitive misorientation is to cognitively mistake that which is not self to be self. So basically ignorance, uh, or, or my, my, my preference is I choose the word confusion. Confusion in relation to the issue of that which is not self, we go make it into self. Then a more subtle form of klesha called delusion. Yeah, so two. Stinginess and other conceptions produced by that root is taught as belonging to the affliction group. And so here, uh, from the two types of afflictions, uh, Chodra says, now if we want to talk about veil, then... Uh, Stinginess and other conceptions produced by that root as a result of not of misunderstanding or confused over that which is not self, taken to be self. The, the afflictions that arise from that cognitive misorientation, that confusion, uh, which is like stinginess, hatred, jealousy, yeah, all those. That, if we want to talk about veil, that is the affliction veil. The conceptions of the three spheres, too, are the agitation of the root, namely cognitive misorientation. Therefore, all veils are the same as the affliction that is cognitive misorientation. If all these afflictions are abandoned along with their habitual traces, perfect Buddhahood is achieved. So here, Chodra goes straight into, he doesn't explain, yeah? Mm. This is how people normally talk about cognitive misorientation and its consequences. This is how people normally talk about delusion and its consequences. He's saying that, all veils is the result of a basically klesha afflictions so sobesh is going to help unpack this in the notes but we, we should continue with the commentary Desire and anger arising from delusion are like the enemy of beings. They are like a robber in a fine dress. 
All these I have here destroyed. Moreover, in the same vein, here with the iron plow of excellent discriminative knowledge, I have completely removed all the pain of suffering arising from the afflictions, along with their dormant roots. Furthermore, in the Ratnamega Sutra, it says, while you dwell in the seat of awakening with the five fire of your noses, you burn away desire, hatred, delusion, and many other impurities. Since the Buddha has taught this, the intention is that at the time of realizing cognitive misorientation as the gnosis of the Dharmadhatu, it is impossible for there to still be impurities left through the other veils. The veil of knowledge and the veil of affliction are similar as to their cause, that is, cognitive misorientation. Until one has abandoned the subtle afflictions of the mind, even having abandoned the veils abiding in body and speech, is like King Suddhana of the tenth stage being attached to Manohari. Moreover, it is like Shonnu Chukye, who maintained his kingdom in an unlawful state due to the afflictions that had forcefully arisen in him during an earlier lifetime. Finally, it is like the Buddha, too, when he was born as the bear bodhisattva, the monkey bodhisattva, the wild herbivore, ruru, and so forth. That is, when he was born as an animal due to the results of earlier afflictions. The Jatakas tell us, the ripening of actions is very terrifying. Even those who have the natural characteristic of compassion are born as animals. But there too, they experience the notion of dharma. Without karma, there would be no conjoining with a further birth. The last line, he says, concerning this quotation, some say that such occurrences as the Buddha piercing his foot with the acacia thorn are not karmic ripening, but reveal the way of samsara. But the truth refutes such claims. And this final one, sit quickly, it says, you know, some people say, oh, in Buddha Shakyamuni's life, yeah, one time his foot was pierced by a, a thorn that caused a lot of pain and bleeding. Uh, another time, Mm, or, or numerous other times, you know, he did not get proper food and went hungry. And they say that, oh, actually, this is not Buddha's karmic ripening. Mm. They say this is just Buddha displaying that uh, to show people the nature of samsara. That means uh, it's not really. But in the Kyobar Mbuche, you know, says, no, 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 it's real. Uh, and, and it's related to karmic ripening yeah, from previous lifetimes. So here the gist of uh, this statement is to say that of the three veils, so two have been clearly identified, the third is the veil of karma, a karmic veil. Uh, what that means is uh, the seeds that have been planted in the past Uh, they uh, are a, a, a type of obscuration uh, that will arise. Then there is the veil of kleshas. Uh, then there is the veil of objects of knowledge. So of the three, the veil of karma is the most gross level. Uh, as in, you know, when, when especially when suffering manifests, uh, that is the veil of karma. Hmm? Suffering manifests overtly. Yeah? But underlying the suffering uh, manifesting overtly is uh, basically our kleshas. Hmm? Then the veil of um, objects of knowledge is related to, remember it says the three spheres. Yeah, the three spheres. Uh, footnote 752, for the three spheres, see above, note 218. Basically, what it's talking about is, uh, for example, in Shantideva, uh, in many other places where it says, you should perform uh, all your virtuous actions free from the notion of the three spheres. 
That means the three domains. What are they talking about? The three domains? The three domains are talking about whenever an action takes place. Whenever an action takes place, yeah, uh, there are three domains. Huh? Right? It's the first is the notion of a subject. I'm looking at 218 now, which is the agent that is acting. Then there is the notion of the object, which is the recipient of that action. Third is the action itself. So when I give you something, the first uh, uh, sphere is uh, I. Uh, I'm thinking, oh, I'm giving Judy something. Uh, so subject is I, object is Judy, then giving uh, is the, the third. Uh, or praising Judy. Uh, or, um, you know, gossiping uh, about Judy. Or calling Judy. So these are the three spheres. So it said that we need to uh, not, uh, we need to purify this notion of the three spheres, meaning subject, object, and action. And, and to purify, what does that mean? Is to understand that these three don't exist in and of themselves. Uh, any of these three uh, don't exist in and of themselves, but exist interdependently. And therefore, if they exist interdependently, therefore they are empty. Not understanding this point results in the veil of objects of knowledge. Why is it called the veil of objects of knowledge? Which is... This is a subtle, a more subtle uh, level of clear seeing. It is said that uh, in the process of purification, on the eighth Bodhisattva Bhumi, uh, the veil of uh, kleshas are gone. Generally speaking, yeah? that's, that's how they say it. But the veil of objects of knowledge are not gone until you are Buddha. So in another context, therefore, it says, you know, emptiness as an object of knowledge, emptiness as, a, as something to be realized, something to be understood, it's easier to achieve than to be able to see the precise uh, um, relationship between cause and effect. So Buddhas can see uh, the intricate uh, network of causes and effects and conditions uh, of how a certain being is experiencing a certain reality as a result of a ripening of a certain karma. It is said that only Buddhas have complete access to that kind of seeing. Yeah. So it's coming from those types of, of discussions eh, that, oh, if an eighth Bhumi Bodhisattva, uh, the veil of uh, Klesha is gone, then surely the veil of objects of knowledge must be a different kind of veil. Yeah? That's, that's the general opinion. But here Kyoparam Bhutya wants to say, actually, all of them are clashes. So, so what, what he's pointing to, I, I feel, uh, is that fundamentally then, mm, this self-cherishing lies at the root So that even on the eighth level bodhisattva, uh, the gross obscuration of klesha is gone, right? There is still self-cherishing uh, on the eighth bhumi, ninth bhumi, tenth bhumi. But 
nowhere close to our kind of self-cherishing. But nonetheless, it's a type of self-cherishing and therefore it's an affliction. And when you are Buddha, then all afflictions and related veils are completely destroyed. Yeah, so let's look at uh, the notes. Uh, this, this will be helpful. Uh, very short, uh, the notes section, uh, but it will be helpful. The Mahayana tradition speaks in general of three veils. The veil of karma, uh, affliction, and the objects of knowledge. Uh, so this is only in the Mahayana philosophical systems. Uh, in the so-called Hinayana philosophical systems, it is said that they don't divide the veils this way. Yeah. One finds these three mentioned, for instance, in the Uttara Tantra. Uh, so, in fact, you know the the key text for Buddha nature for Mahamudra yeah, do talk about the three veils. In general, it is held that the veil of karma is abandoned up to the path of seeing. So, the first uh, that we can kind of. Uh, uh, cut ourselves off of, uh, to be free from, uh, is the grossest of the three, the veil of karma. Yeah. So, uh, the veil of affliction up to the seventh bodhisattva stage, meaning uh, the veil of karma uh, uh, continues to be powerful until you achieve the first bhumi. When you achieve the first bhumi, which is here called path of seeing, uh, I wish uh, this is not so confusing. Uh, it should just say, it is held that the veil of karma is abandoned uh, up to the first bodhisattva stage, which corresponds with the path of seeing. <laughs> There's always these two, two parallel way of looking at the same process. One is called the five paths. One is called the 10 stages of bodhisattvas. Uh, but the, the path of seeing is the first stage of bodhisattva. So here, I don't know, maybe. Uh, in general, it is held that the veil of karma is abandoned up to, uh, or rather, it is in, I would say, in general, you know, the veil of karma is operative until you are on the first bodhisattva stage. Then other veils are still uh, in uh, active uh, at the first bodhisattva stage. So, from the second stage to the seventh stage, the veil of uh, affliction are still operative. And, and of course, you know, when it says the veil of affliction, klesha is operative, you should know that the veil of the third, the most subtle veil, the veil of uh, objects of knowledge is also there, you know. Then, the veil of knowledge is the last veil that is operative, active, from eight, nine. Is that clear? I am not sure I understand, or I know I don't understand, the veil of karma is abandoned. I mean, abandon, uh, karma continues to ripen even for Buddhas. So, what is it? They don't mean? create. They don't you're create. You're not creating more negative even karma. On the first level, you're not creating more bad karma. Yeah. Or more undesirable karma. Yeah. Okay. No more unskillful karma being created. When you are at the first bodhisattva bhumi. Yeah, but the two more, the other two veils are still there huh? to cloud, to cloud your 
clear seeing. Then first Bodhisattva Bhumi all the way to the seventh. The veil of uh, Klesha will become less and less. If, if you're still having afflictive emotions, mm -hmm. how is it possible not to create karma that will result in undesirable effects? It's about how subtle. Right? So when they talk about karma, then they're talking about physical. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, what you're detecting is basically these types of divisions that they want to articulate. They are not so clean. <laughs> there are problems. And hence, Jigden Sumgun is going to, you know. Just say forget you. all that and. Yeah, get not it so much forget nugget, all that, get but it down like. To the nugget. Sorry? Get it down to the nugget, which is yes. confusion. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so all, all of this is just generally, this is how huh, the scholars and the tradition builders and the doctors of the church, so to say, have used their, you know, analysis and to come up with all these categories. Now, Chikten Sungun, however, subsumes all veils under one, the veil of affliction. <clears throat> Choti Choki Drakpa cites Uttara Tantra, according to which all conceptions of the three spheres avail of the objects of knowledge. <laughs> that is, whenever the three components, such as the notions of agent, patient, and action, uh, patient, uh, I don't know, and action, subject, object, you know, and action, or any similar dualistic dissociation arise as a conceptual mind, that is the veil of the objects of knowledge. According to the same verse, all conceptions such as stinginess are a veil through affliction. The rather terse argument that follows in the light of the sun interprets this verse as presenting conception as the root and stinginess as its branch since an affliction like stinginess is merely a particular kind of concept. However, the root of both root and branches, that is, of conception and affliction, is cognitive misorientation and delusion, which is the root affliction. Thus, all concepts and afflictions, and all karma, therefore, arise from that. If all afflictions are abandoned along with their dormant roots, perfect Buddhahood is achieved. Thus, since cognitive misorientation is the root, when one realizes cognitive misorientation as the gnosis, as the wisdom of the Dharma Dhatu, all other impurities are removed. On the other hand, until one has completely eliminated the root cause, one's problems have not yet come to an end. So basically, again, this Vajra statement is, you can imagine, you know, some monks sitting around talking about, you know, bringing out their textbooks, whether literal texts or they have memorized, you know, saying, oh, at the first Bhumi, this is what happens. At the seventh Bhumi, this is what happened. At the tenth Bhumi, this is what happened. And then you can imagine, you know, uh, Judy there will say, wait, 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 wait. How can karma really be gone when there is still... Uh, you know, the kleshas going on. Then you're like, wait, 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 wait. How can kleshas really be gone as long as there is subject and object, right? So yeah, you're seeing, right? The, the problem with that. Yeah. Now, what is interesting to me, again, you know, there's probably things that I'm not seeing. Uh, you know, not probably, definitely there are things that I'm not seeing. Yeah? The, the gongshik is not... Def, you know, uh, not so easy, you know, either. Uh, because, so so the part of me that goes here is I say, so why don't Kyoba Rinpoche said, 
The root of all is the third, the veil of objects of knowledge, which is subject object, you know. Why not there? Why not say that, you know? I don't know, you know. I, I, I cannot think, you know, why. I have not been able to uh, really understand. Why, why doesn't then he say, you know, the three veils are basically the veil of the objects of knowledge, which is the most subtle of the three. Karma is the gross. <clears throat> Klesha is the middling. Then the very subtle, right, mm, ob subject object, you know, as long as there is notions of subject and object and action, then. Yeah. And I think, okay, so then now I'm speculating. So I think the reason why he doesn't say that is that <clears throat> in some ways he's, he is one thing to uh, one thing to emphasize, you know, like the most obvious thing that we have to work on which is the clashes. In, in some ways, the clashes are gross enough, obvious enough, and fundamental to uh, karma. But the subject-object veil, right, as articulated as a type of veil, might be so subtle that, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you and I, right? When things don't go right, right? Immediately, right now, what do we do? We think it's outside. So you can call that karma. You think it's outside. When things don't go well, you might think it's outside. Then for those who are over-educated, when things don't go well, when things don't go well, then they think, oh, it's due to, you know, very subtle ignorance, subject and object. <laughs> then there's the, the position which I think is advocated in this statement, which is, how about you look at your clashes right now? Instead of like speculating subject, object, all that, <clears throat> you know, high wisdom, profound wisdom over here, or blaming what's going on outside? Look at the clashes. <clears throat> and then when you look at the clashes, <clears throat> what, are, what is the root of clashes? Mistaking that which is not self as self. So self-grasping. So that's the main yeah, that's the main kind of focus for us, yeah, is to look at that. Does that make sense? My speculation? <clears throat> we have to speak, I cannot read minds. It, it does, um, but I think it is also helpful to realize this subject-object action as a way to even see a need to look at clashes. There's no question about that. That's why there is the, the obscuration of karma. There's in, in, nowhere in here is it saying that they are not relevant. I mean, to me, it's an easier way to get to another way of looking at it. I mean, if you see sort of we're all in this and if I hadn't done this and this might not happen, if you sort of begin to go down that road, to me, it... You it, have to go there, of course. Yeah. We, we, we're not debating, you know. <laughs> Can you throw out one of these three? No, no, no. I don't mean that. I mean, yes. it, it, that's just an easier starting point for me.
personal. Gil Rinpoche, he says, you know, them. that's not, that's not. Because why? Okay, so now I will go continue in the direction. Why? If things are going well, are you going to think of that? No. You don't. We don't. So it's an abstract. When suffering arises in that moment, self-grasping to recognize that as the root. So this is what he's saying. This is the root of all the other problems. What I'm trying to make a case of here is why doesn't he say subject object is the root? My speculation is because it's more subtle. Then the analysis can become abstract. Now, elsewhere it says, you know, if, if the wisdom doesn't strike at where it hurts the most, it's not doing uh, the work. And where it hurts the most is self-grasping. Where, where the ego is not undermined, the subject-object analysis can become kind of like a, a, a very nice idea. But when it identifies self-grasping as the root, you know, there is not so easy, but also very necessary. So the klesha avarana, klesha avarana, the klesha affliction, or the klesha veil. It says that that is more subtle, it turns into karma veil. I mean, more gross, it turns into karma veil. More subtle, it's the Veil of object of knowledge. And so in other words, here, this, this statement here is to emphasize, you know, the place where we see most clearly is where, uh, when the klesha arises. When any of the kleshas arise. That is where we see most clearly where the problem is. And we should focus on there, is what he's saying. And and this klesha is also related to uh, conception. <laughs> mm. No, we should not talk about that yet. Um, it will come up. Now, 4.13, all systems of tenets obscure the truth. And so, so this last statement is related to uh, statement 13. Statement 12 is sort of like an a introduction into statement uh, 13. 
and uh, we might think, you know, how how is this business of tenants? Tenants means like philosophical positions. As I said last time, you know, some of you, especially if you're associated with uh, Casa Tibet, Guatemala, you, you are much more educated in this uh, than others. Uh, because I know you have, you know, been introduced to these tenant systems. Uh, this tenant systems uh, is an important topic, uh, important way of, of, of understanding, you know, um, the kind of lay of the land of the Buddhist, the Tibetan Buddhist kind of universe. And the levels of subtlety in terms of analysis of emptiness, analysis of mind. Um, so there's tremendous emphasis uh, in, in the Indo-Tibetan from the Nalanda tradition, the studying of tenets. Tenets means uh, doctrinal uh, positions. So in the Nalanda tradition, the, the, the great Buddhist university that developed in India, yeah, um, over time, uh, the Nalanda tradition articulated a way of relating to all the different Buddhist traditions that have existed prior to Nalanda, all the different Buddhist traditions that have existed, instead of considering them as different groups of people arguing, what did the Buddha really teach? which probably I think to be, you know, kind of very objective as a historian looking at the material, you could say, yeah, I think, you know, back then people kind of thought of it that way. Like this group to say this, this group says this, this group says this, this group says this, you know, that, yeah, when the people were actually engaged in like, you know, disagreeing and arguing with each other, um, they really felt like, you know, like what did the master really say? What did the Buddha really say? No, he, he meant this. No, 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 he meant that. No, 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 he meant this. No, no, he meant that. So, so all these different. So even as early, uh, there is a reference to the 18 chapters of the Buddhist uh, kind of, um, you could say the Buddhist monastic community. Uh, there were 18 chapters, uh, like, like fraternities, sororities, and their local chapters. So originally these chapters, uh, they kind of differed from each other, uh, originally in a more practical, for, for a more kind of not ideological difference, but geographic difference. Uh, so, so you have these chapters and over time, geographic differences also gave rise to differences in interpreting initially monastic rules. So some of the earliest disagreements have to do with, um, uh, is salt a type of food? Because in the monastic rules, it says uh, monastics should not um, keep food, now, even overnight. If you're very strict about it, you should not keep any food. You cannot, you either finish it this meal or give it away. You should not say, ah, I'm going to save, you know, this last bite of, of my cheesecake for tomorrow. No. So at some point, the question of is salt food or not? So one group said salt is not food. So you can keep. So we'll sprinkle a little, you know. But another group said, no, 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 salt is food. You cannot keep. So initially, the differences had to do with, you could say, cohesiveness of a community. Because you cannot have, right? Some monks are not saying, oh, I'm, I, I'm, I can keep some salt. Some said, no, I, you cannot keep any salt. So initially, the differences were based on that. 
But then over time, you know, like these differences of seemingly, right, about interpreting monastic rules got people to think in a way, you could say think deeper about, well, what are the implications of saying this is the right way and this is the wrong way? So people, you could say, thought more deeply. What are the implications? So that now uh, it's not just about rules and how they are interpreted. Uh, it has also become kind of more ideological. So questions of like, what is the nature of a Buddha? Does the Buddha continue to exist in some form or not? So then it so it became more and more in that direction that then eventually you have all these different positions staked out. Yeah. So by the time of Nalanda, tenth, eleventh century, you know, even earlier. 10-11 is very late already in Nalanda. But uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, Nalanda, the mainstream kind of Buddhist institution, articulated a way of looking back at all these differences. And rather than saying, the following groups are right or wrong, and the following groups are right or wrong. Rather than doing that, they came up with a more unifying, you could say, attitude, which is, for the most part, you know, there were maybe some exceptions, for the most part, all the different positions, they were right for particular levels of one's development. So you could say practically nothing was absolutely wrong. So this is a very, uh, sometimes it's been uh, pointed out as a very Indian attitude, as opposed to like desert culture. Uh, the Abrahamic tradition uh, is different in how they deal with differences. The Abrahamic traditions, it seems that they, the way to deal with differences is to declare one as true and everything else as false. The Indian way is all is true. Some are more true than others. <laughs> so then there is the idea of progressing through your level of development and understanding, becoming more and more refined, more and more refined, more and more refined. So Nalanda did that. So that is when it came up with all these tenets, all these philosophical positions staked out by Buddhist groups uh, up until the time of Nalanda uh, were arranged uh, in a way so that then uh, it says, you know, like uh, you have the four philosophical uh, traditions, the four tenant systems. Two of the tenant systems belong to the Hinayana category, and two of the tenant systems belong to the, the Mahayana category. But there were definitely way more than these four. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, they get divided into these four tenant systems. So here, Kyoba mm, Rinpoche's statement is all tenant systems obscure the truth. <laughs> they hide, they conceal. Uh, so this is in response to what? People claim that the truth of true reality, yeah, this is really Buddhist talk, the truth of true reality. <laughs> People claim that the truth of true reality, the truth of Dharmata, 
is realized. Dharmata is a really is a very interesting word, you know. I think English uh, there's no good translation. Sometimes I prefer to just leave it in Sanskrit. Dharmata. Dharma is you know can be translated as truth, but dharma also means phenomena. So dharma ta ta is like ness in English. The ness, the the reality, the essence of phenomena. So the truth of phenomena. The truth of phenomena ness. <laughs> People claim that the truth of dharmata is realized by negating the wrong tenets and mastering the correct one. Ah, so it is in response. Again, you can imagine a group of monks who came to study with Gyobar Rinpoche, maybe after eating lunch or during lunch, you know, sitting together and you know, they're debating the tenets, you know, and say, well, your view is a lower view, you know, you need to work through that lower view and get to the next view, a more profound view, and say, no, 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 the more profound view is actually this view and this view, and you can imagine Kyopa Rinpoche just kind of walking over and says, all tenant systems obscure the truth. And he walks away. And then they all go, huh? Because at that time, you know, there was a lot of emphasis on uh, you need to get all these uh, tenets uh, clear uh, and see what is wrong with the lower view uh, and what is wrong with that so that you can progress to the next level. And then when you arrive at the next level, you should see what is wrong with that level and progress to the next level and the next level and the next level. Uh, so according to that view, uh, the main job is to uh, negate the wrong views, the wrong tenets, and to master the correct one. Uh, Gilbert Rinpoche says, you know, as long as you are intellectually doing all of this, they are all necessarily um, obscuring. They are all necessarily uh, obscuring. The absolute truth is beyond the mind sphere. This is almost, uh, you could say, uh, a paraphrase of Shantideva, uh, where he says, you know, the intellect, the mind. Uh, here, mind is talking about the intellect, the thinking mind. Uh, this intellect uh, cannot touch uh, the absolute truth. Uh, this is Shantideva. The absolute truth is beyond the mind sphere and is obscured by mind-made systems of tenets. Holding as mine. And so that, that is the real core of the problem. Holding as mine. My view. We talked about this at the beginning when we were first starting the study of this, where I said, even holding to Gongjing and say, this is my view, then you have done the same you have fallen into the same trap. Even with Gongchik, you know, if you say this is my, uh, or, or this is the correct view, uh, but more subtle there is, why is it correct? Because it's the one that I subscribe to. Holding as mine, and by impure thoughts that praise oneself and abuse others. So you see how even in the commentary, you know, it's brought back to, uh what's 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 more practically going on just like in the last statement you know it wants to park its emphasis so to say on when glaciers manifest and understand all the other veils as basically the glacier veil yes you can go into the subject object and think about that sure but he, he wants us to go back to self-grasping. And when there's self-grasping, then cherishing self. And even in the subtle way of cherishing self, my view is correct, your view is wrong. Hmm? Then, you know, 
Gong Chik is right, you know, Sakya Pandita is wrong. Then, my understanding of Gong Chik is right, your understanding of Gong Chik is not so right. <laughs> Immediately, Chodra warns us this, you know. The absolute truth is beyond mind sphere. And now it's obscured by mind-made systems of tenants. And then, and, 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 and when we say that, you know, mind-made systems of tenants and obscured, you know, what, what is actually obscuring? He doesn't go into, you know, like, uh, well, it's, uh, he doesn't go into philosophical stuff. What is it that is obscuring? Holding as mind. And by impure thoughts that praise oneself and abuse others, that denigrate others. So, so the San, Sanchayagata says, what does not exist, they call non-existent. Childish ones analyze it, creating existence and non-existence. Both existence and non-existence are non-existent phenomena. The bodhisattva who knows this is certainly released. <laughs> Moreover, in the same vein, the bodhisattva who does not perceive past and future boundaries and appearances of the present. The bodhisattva does not perceive past and future boundaries and appearances of the present. For him, the three times are pure. Pure is the, 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 the tantric vocabulary for empty. So this is uh, in the Diamond Sutra, it says, you know, the mind of the past moment cannot be found. The mind of the future moment cannot be found and the mind of the present moment cannot be found. Mm -hmm. Li Qing wants us to know what's going on at her house. Let me mute her. Okay. <laughs> the person is unconditioned. Oi, again, mute. The person is unconditioned and free from proliferation. The person meaning this bodhisattva, this person. This is the conduct of the supreme Pranya Paramita. Furthermore, another quote, one should make great efforts toward an understanding that arises from listening, which again is constituted by the natural character characteristic of having become completely familiar with the four topics of knowledge, namely grammar, logic, medicine, and Buddhist philosophy. This is the cause of obtaining other unsurpassable knowledges arising from contemplation and practice. True reality is realized through no other cause but the equipoise of the mind. This quote is a little odd huh, occurring here because uh, it seems to, be, you know, here it's saying, you know, first you listen, then you contemplate, then you practice. So here it says, you no, know, you learn <clears throat> the four topics of knowledge, namely learn grammar, <clears throat> learn how to read and write properly, then learn reasoning, you know, logic. Then it says also learn medicine. So medicine and Buddhist philosophy, those are how to be well physically and how to be well mental, emotionally. So this is like Indian, uh, mainstream Indian Buddhist topics. Nalanda, they teach this. They teach grammar. They teach, you know, so grammar is, you know, the very basis of knowledge, especially now people are reading. Then not only grammar, but logic as in epistemology, which is how do you gain knowledge? Understand the way, and not just blindly 
gaining knowledge, but even understand the process in which knowledge is gained, which is what logic is about. Then under grammar, you can say also you learn about why things are called the, the way they are called. Then learn uh, how knowledge is acquired. Learn about logic. Learn about like principal ways of analyzing things. And now, you know, uh, we have lost this more classical training, so the world is upside down. We cannot even agree on, you know, how to analyze things. But in this system, yeah, learn grammar and logic. Then medicine, how to maintain physical health. Buddhist philosophy, how to maintain good, you can say, mental health. And this is the cause of obtaining other unsurpassable knowledges that arises from contemplation and practice. These are the three wisdoms to listen, to reflect, and to cultivate. Finally, but bottom line, true reality is realized through no other cause but the equipoise of the mind. When the mind settles evenly, then true reality can be realized. So in a way, for me, this quote is a little bit odd here. It's almost like all this that came before is a, kind of takes away from the statement. So we'll see, you know, why it's here. Maybe we'll see it. Maybe we don't. Yeah? Continuing on. Moreover, the Bodhicayavatara says, absolute reality is not an object of the sphere of the mind. Yeah, that I told you this. The mind is held to be relative truth, which is the intellect. Here, the, the mind is a, a big word in Buddhist material. It could refer to so many different things, so many aspects. You know, when we are dealing with Mahamudra material, mind has a different meaning. Here, it's talking about the intellect. So, the intellect is this is held to be in the realm of relative truth. So the sphere of the mind, the sphere of the intellect, eh? the intellect cannot reach absolute reality. So this is the quote from Bodhicayavatara. There is a question. <clears throat> mm -hmm. uh, I remember uh, the sutra, the Her Sutra. Uh, where we learn that the, we need the form to understand the the, the vacuum, the uh -huh, emptiness, the, the emptiness. Mm -hmm. uh, and I I think the same. I don't know if it's, if I understand well. Mm -hmm. It's the same. We need the mind for arise the equipoise equipoise of of mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, it's the um, the vehicle, but mm -hmm. it's not the um, the final um, yes i understand like we need to think to analyze to logic yes to for to arise uh the heart yes and in logion also uh, you yes who told us that the the, the difference between relative and absolute yes and yes. also it's the same relative yes. truth and absolute truth yes Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Uh, then uh, it is shown that, uh, the next quote, it is shown that as something is grasped, there is complete affliction. It is taught that anything not focused on as self or mind is completely purified. So here, you know, the real issue here is about grasping of self. Now apply in the context of opinions and views and philosophical positions and my view and your view and that. More what the Lord Pamudrupa says, however many different systems of tenets there may be, apart from being systems of holding opinions, nothing is truly established by them. 
Right? They're just a holding of opinions. When one realizes the thoughts as dharmakaya, one will overcome one's orientation of attachment to systems of tenets. In a way, you could say that, you know, um, like it or not, we, we hold opinions. So I don't think here he's saying don't study them huh? or don't have any opinions because it's not possible. We will. So in that sense, it's better to hold uh, these kind of Buddhist tenets uh, than to let like samsaric tenets <laughs> be like our way of like operating in the world. Uh, but the main point is, he says that, understand the limits. Uh, to me, this is what it's saying. Understand the limits of these tenets. Don't hold to them so tightly. Use them as reference point, as Ariana, you were saying. You can use them skillfully to direct you to the heart of the matter. But know that none of them are the heart of the matter. The essence of what we are supposed to see. Still moreover, Jigden Gompo says, may those who confuse the systems of tenets, which are a knot of the mind with the Buddha's intention, realize true reality. Suchness. And may their graspings to thoughts be purified in itself. So systems of tenets, uh, these positions, they are a knot. They are knots of the mind. Yeah? Your mind is all tied up in knots. Uh, and don't mistake that as the Buddha's intention, meaning the Buddha's wisdom. Instead, may they realize suchness. Still more, Drigong Lingpa, Sherab Jungne says, the traps and sidetracks of the concepts of contemplating and practicing, the concept of being touched by the great three, and the systems of tenets that are established by truths, these are the three enemies of the lion of emptiness. <laughs> we already saw, you know, Vajra statements that address this. Right? The sidetracks, the traps uh, that comes from listening, contemplating, and practicing. Yeah, there's a Vajra statement like that. Uh, they, they, they will mislead you. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, it's not saying don't listen, don't contemplate, don't practice. No, no, no. It's not saying that, but it's saying, you know, understand their limits. Therefore, in the beginning, there is the self-grasping of the I. And because of that, transmigration due to the labeling of my dharma or my system of tenants or his system of tenants as mine and others. So the Manyamaka Avatara says, I bow down to those who have compassion for beings who at the beginning saying I and being attached to the self and saying this is mine and therefore give rise to attachment to things are powerless like a revolving water wheel. Yeah. Who at the beginning, yeah, they're talking about beings. So here, Madhyamaka Avatara, Chandakirti says, I bow down to those who have compassion. So it's to bodhisattvas who have compassion for beings. So, 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 for beings who have what problem? They have the problem of believing in I, grasping to I, and they're attached to self. Once attached, once the notion of self is present, then, so first me, then followed by mine. So once there's me, there's mine. Once there's, once there's mine, Mine, then there is attachment. 
The Pramanavartika says, if there is a notion of self, other things are known as other. From the pair self and other arises grasping and aversion. From combining these two, all the faults arise. So it's very interesting to me uh, that here, uh, when it says all systems of tenets obscure the truth, in the commentary, you know, uh, it turns out that in the commentary, uh, there is no interest in actually debating those views. Uh, no mention at all. Uh, Vaibhashika, Sautrantika, Chittamatra, Madhyamaka, Swatantrika, Prasangika, uh, Shentong, Rantong. No, no mention of that at all. The issue is brought back to uh, self grasping, grasping of self and other, which is the cognitive misorientation that gives rise to. The klesha of afflictive emotions. The, the, the veil of afflictive emotions, kleshas. So despite vocabulary, like this Vajra statement sounds like it's going to start debating the different tenant systems. And the last Vajra statement looks like more of a men, mental, psychological there, there are two. They, they, they actually uh, inform each other. This is talking about the problem of uh, a more basic problem of self-grasping, and self-grasping that then manifest uh, in in the realm of um, um, holding on to opinions as these are my opinions, those are your opinions, these are my truth, that is your truth, my truth is better than your truth. Yeah, this is what uh, the commentary is most concerned about. Uh, in the notes, um, in the Tibetan context, Mahayana view is systematized in the form of tenets. Uh, actually, uh, I, I would say not just Mahayana view, in the Tibetan context, uh, all the whole range of Buddhist traditions, positions, schools, uh, they're systematized in the form of tenets. Yeah. So anyway, mm -hmm. Um, quickly, Sobish's notes, uh, it says, Jigden Sumgan's fundamental critique of intellectual methods does not go so far as to dismiss all intellectual training, but it denies that one can thereby achieve an ultimate truth through intellectual methods. In fact, intellectual activity is clearly visible in Chogi Drakpa's own commentary when he provides arguments. We have also learned in Vajra Statement 117 that in addition to direct valid cognition, direct uh, perception of reality, Jigden Sumgan also accepts valid inference, at least in the form of logical sign of the result. Yeah. So another Vajra Statement that we have already looked at, uh, Jigden Sumgan says, uh, inference uh, is, is, is a good way of understanding things can lead to uh, understanding. So, so here Sobish is offering how he does not completely dismiss uh, uh, intellectual engagement. However, what he's saying is 
any construction of tenants held as mine, however, is seen as a waste of time and in fact a dangerous thing, a dangerous aberrance. Yet, it should be noted that Jigden Sumban states as many reservations about intellectual knowledge as he states about attachment to experiences arising in meditative practice. These two, when they get turned into mind, constitute nothing but traps and sidetracks. So as much as he is warning us against uh, getting caught up in philosophical debates, he also tells us you can also get caught up in meditative experiences. And bottom line for both types of getting caught up is based on the veil of pleasure. Mine, I, <laughs> and pride. The starting point of the argument is the fact that absolute truth is beyond the mind's sphere. The Rinjangma states, analysis and investigation with the mind of an ordinary being does not establish the Buddha's intention, does not actually take us to the Buddha's wisdom. Moreover, absolute truth is obscured by those mind-made systems of tenets that people hold as mind and by the impure thoughts that arise through that attachment that esteems oneself and denigrates others. Doji Sherab elaborates that one does not realize true reality through refutation of bad tenets and intellectual fabrication of good tenets, since tenets, since absolute truth is beyond the sphere of the proliferating mind. The system of tenets, however, are intellectual fabrications produced by an obscure proliferating mind, and while one can fathom and validate the tenets with that mind, one cannot differentiate absolute truth into separate parts and fathom it with this kind of mind, this intellectual. Thus, as long as one has not separated oneself from this proliferating mind, this mind that keeps churning out thoughts, concepts, ideas, all powered by self-cherishing, as long as you have not separated from that, one does not realize absolute true reality. And no systems of tenets whatsoever can reach true reality. But how is true reality access realized? Rinjangma says, like space, absolute truth is vast, and like an ocean, it is deep like being inseparable from the state that is difficult to fathom, and like being one with the taste of salt water in a vast ocean, the Buddhas have truly blended non-dually with the Dharmakaya. They accomplish the same great effort of disciplined conduct. Please practice the resolve for awakening and devoted reliance on the excellent Guru. This is the answer. Discipline conduct. So watch cause and effect very carefully to the best of our ability. And we know we cannot, we are not able to completely at this state to be free from committing negative karma. But to the best of our ability, great effort in discipline conduct. Then practice, keep strengthening the resolve for awakening, bodhicitta, relative bodhicitta especially. Keep strengthening that. Now, earlier we looked at how, with regards to bodhicitta, two, two things need to be uh, made stronger. One, your aspiration and your action should match better and better. Right now we can work on aspiration. But we should also let our action 
try to let our action go more in line with our aspiration. One aspect. Second aspect, these two can become stronger and stronger and stronger. Right now, it's still weak. So that's the second point. And third, devoted reliance on the excellent Guru. Seeing the Guru as Dharmakaya. Which is not about hero worshipping, right? We've talked about this endlessly. It's not about hero worshipping. It's not about becoming a slave to someone. This is using the Guru, for lack of a better word, using, but don't manipulate your Guru. Using your Guru to help you see Dharmakaya. Guru's Dharmakaya, your Dharmakaya, the Dharmakaya of all beings. So, Rinjang Ma says, if you really want to under realize the absolute truth, then uh, most of your energy, uh, use it here in this area. Discipline conduct, bodhicitta, and devoted reliance on the excellent Guru. Okay. Good. So, uh, yeah, the next uh, few statements, uh, it's talking about the level of Shravakas, the level of Pracheka Buddhas, the level of Bodhisattvas, uh, of the different stages. And then the the seventh stage here I, 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 I'm saying you know so so right here you know uh, Jiden Simgun wants to take uh, these different positions these different tenant systems not so much as schools or philosophical traditions that you sign up uh, and defend but rather to see that they are actual states of development so that Chitta Matra, for example, it means mind only. Yes, it can refer to specific people who hold this position, specific texts, uh, specific debate. But he wants to use Chitta Matra in a more uh, path-oriented way, uh, which is, he says, true Chitta Matra uh, is when you arrive at the seventh Bodhisattva stage when you can see not just see but you can you have finally realized yeah, and stabilized and realized and accepted you know all of that that all our perceptions of happiness and suffering are perceptions therefore everything is mind only then related to earlier discussion about bodhisattva path it says it's only at that seventh level uh, that then uh, you can, only at the seventh level, uh, can you, uh, as a great bodhisattva, do dangerous things. Before you are there, these dangerous things that bodhisattvas uh, are permitted by the Buddha to do, uh, it's not permitted because the Buddha is going to give you a get-out-of-jail-free ticket. It's only permitted because you now have the ability, the capacity to handle whatever that comes your way. So for the next few statements, you will see how... So first, in this statement here, all tenant systems, he's talking about the conventionally uh, way of looking at the tenant system, which is, oh, this philosophical school, oh, Nagarjuna started this one, oh, Asanga started this one, oh, then, you know, Ari, uh, Arya Deva comes along and modifies Nagarjuna this way, then Chandakirti came, uh, then Shanti Deva came, then Buddha Palita came, you know, Bhava, Bhavya, uh, Bhava Viveka came, and this and that, and 
and, and so Kilbar Rinpoche said, all those things, yeah? <laughs> it's just can, can get you sidetracked. Then he says, okay, now, having understood that, you know, or, or shut up, Jung, they arrange it in such a way that having understood that, now we can look at what is the limitation of the Shravaka. What, what, what does the Shravaka level takes you to? And what are the limitations? What are the Prateka Buddha level takes you to? And what are the limitations? And likewise, the first Bhumi, the seventh Bhumi, so in a way, you know, Sherab Jungne arranges the statements in such a way so that he can say, we're not talking about, you know, uh, looking down on Sharvakas or looking down on Prajika Buddhas or looking down on Chittamatra or looking down on Hinayana. We're not talking about that at all. Here we're talking about the actual maturing of our mm, progress towards Buddhahood. So that's it for today. Uh, we meet again on Wednesday. Mm. And uh, Friday, we are not going to meet. Yeah? This coming Friday, we won't meet. But we will meet on Wednesday morning. Chang Chu Sem Chu Rinpoche Ma ge pa nam ge gyu chi ge pa nyam pa me pa yang gong ne gong lu pe war shu The first uh, official Dharma, uh, Dragon Dharma Kirti Sangha uh, gathering is going to be the first Wednesday of December. First Wednesday of December, 7 o'clock New York time. Okay? PM. 7 PM New York time. Okay, Tata. Thank you.